Uh, my name is Joe Turo. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're going to do a tag team kind of thing uh, about this um, paper that we're writing called Total Court Sociology of Visual Resignation. Uh, it's based on some research that we did a couple of years ago, a national survey. And the survey itself led to some really interesting questions about the notion of resignation in society, which I'll discuss. And we'll talk about questions, what does it mean? And, and how can we understand it? And, and we argue that, in fact, we need, as a field, a sociology of resignation in order to dig deeper. Uh, we're going to be talking about measuring digital resignation, building a theory about digital resignation, cultivating resignation through what we call obfuscation. Uh, in other words, what causes resignation and who does it? Why does it happen? And where do we go from here? Um, the, there's a notion that we started the survey with about why Americans, we're talking about down south, uh, seem to give up their data, and particularly from a marketing perspective. Marketers constantly say, Americans care about their data, but give them 20 cents off and they'll give it up. They'll give up their mother's maiden name, one person told me. And the question is, what's going on? Uh, how do we understand this? It's called a privacy paradox. And um, there's a variety of answers that marketers and some others give to this, academics, some activists. One, marketers often say people really don't care. If you ask them, they say they care about the data, but really they don't care about the data. Another is um, people don't know why it's important to care about data in the moment. So they may say they care about their attention about it, but if you give them a discount or you give them some other reason, they'll give you the data and it's not that big a deal. Academics and um, some others, activists, have said, well, it's because people don't really know much about what's going on behind the screen, and that's why they uh, give up their data. They, they think it's relatively benign. Tell us something about yourself, you know, and, and give up the data, and they don't understand data mining. They don't understand what's happening. And another simply is that people don't know how to protect themselves. So you have all of these reasons as to why people might be giving up their data to explain the privacy paradox. For a number of reasons that we could get into um, maybe in the question and answer period, we don't think that these are sufficient. We, we started a survey, a national survey that we did, uh, with the notion that, that there may be some other really important reasons that have to do, this is by the way a quote about um, this notion that, that um, marketers have about trade-off. When they go online, Americans demonstrate a willingness to share information. As more consumers begin to recognize the value and self-benefit of allowing advertisers to use data in the right way. This is a common notion that advertisers have that we're really talking about a trade-off. People know what they're doing, it's logical, they're willing to give up data given that they get something in return. So for a number of reasons we can go into later, we thought that's not sufficient. Even the notion of knowledge, we thought may not be the real reason. Anecdotally and from other reason, um, purposes, we thought, gee, there must be some sense that people have resignation. And we operationalized the idea of resignation in, uh, with two statements, together with a whole variety of other statements that we gave people. So it wasn't just these two statements, and they were randomized. One was, I want to have control over what marketers can learn about me online. The other was, I've come to accept that I have little control about what marketers can learn about me online. And they were given, as I say, together with numbers of other statements, randomly. If people agreed with both of them, we said they are resigned, meaning that they, they would like something to happen, they would like to have privacy, but they realize they really can't. As it turned out, 58% uh, of Americans agreed with both of those statements. So 58% of Americans um, have a sense of resignation. And by the way, it gets even darker in the sense that we also asked them uh, if they agree with the following statement, when a, uh, uh, if a company has data about me, it can't harm me. And if you include the people who disagreed with that, who said it can harm me, 44% of Americans were resigned and believed that companies can harm them if they have their data. 
So the question is, what is the reason for that kind of widespread resignation? And the tag team begins. Um, so our survey report doesn't uh, sort of answer this question of why Americans are, are resigned, except to suggest that people are kind of pessimistic about achieving privacy from unwanted surveillance in this kind of digital information <coughs> privacy uh, landscape. Um, but our, our findings do suggest the opportunity to jumpstart uh, that which we're calling this sort of sociology of digital resignation. And by this, what we mean is a multifaceted understanding of the institutional, organizational, communal, and interpersonal uh, forces that are encouraging this feeling that people have of futility when it comes to digital surveillance. Um, and so we've, we've done some research about this term resi uh, resignation, and it's not a term that comes up a whole lot in uh, sociology and almost uh, uh, not at all in communication scholarship. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, Max Weber was using uh, this term resignation, uh, but kind of to talk a little bit more about the sociology of religion and uh, what he was thinking about this, the, the, the fate of human uh, culture. So although sociologists have not talked much about futility as a way to understand social life, there are two approaches to re uh, resignation uh, that I do want to talk about here from other intellectual traditions that inform the way that we're thinking about building this idea of, of the sociology of digital resignation. And the first speaks directly to the things that we're talking about at, at a meta level, um, or sort of at a societal level. Um, and this uh, comes from the article, uh, Capitalism and the Politics of Resignation by cultural anthropologists Peter Benson and Stuart Kirsch. Um, and writing in the Journal of, of, Cult of Current Anthropology, they argued that uh, corporate responses to public criticism and regulatory threats rely on strategies aimed at maintaining control. And they described uh, three main phases to the strategic responses of companies when faced with sort of public or regulatory um, uh, uh, pushback. Uh, and these actually parallel some of the things that Paul Edwards was just discussing around kind of corporate responses um, or, or uh, legal responses to, to the environment. So they are denial, acknowledgement and token accommodation, and then strategic engagement of the issue. And what um, Benson and Kirsch say is that the aim of these activities is to, quote, protect these industries from potential de delegitimation and allow them to continue operating in favorable regulatory environments. So they connect these strategies to what they call the deliberate cultivation of public resignation, which is this pervasive feeling of discontent about the present and the perceived inability to change the future. And what they say is this cultivation of resignation is actually a very important part of contemporary capitalist environments, right? So the idea that you can actually make consumers uh, feel resigned through your corporate activities may actually work to benefit you as a, as a company. Then the other place uh, that we're kind of looking comes uh, moving away from cultural anthropology to social psychology um, operates, this idea of resignation operates at a more um, individual level. Uh, so this uh, article uh, is from the 1950s, and what Robert Foreman was trying to do here was to understand uh, collective behavioral responses, and he was um, operating at a time where theories of collective responses tended to say uh, that people would either engage when faced with disaster uh, in mass panic, right, the kind of idea of the wisdom of the crowds, um, or in rational attempts at self-protection. Uh, and so he was looking at an uh, instance in Oshkosh, Washington, where um, an, uh, an alarm was raised, a, a nuclear uh, alarm siren went off uh, inadvertently. It was an accidental alarm. <coughs> and what he found was that um, people actually didn't engage in mass panic, and people actually didn't engage in a whole lot of uh, self-preservation. Instead, what they did is uh, they went about their routines and paid very little attention to the alarm um, that you know potentially was suggesting um, an air raid or some sort of nuclear disaster. And he said that when he talked to people, what he found was a number of reasons for this response. People didn't know what action to take, they didn't believe an airstrike was coming, or they saw no point in attempting to protect themselves if indeed a nuclear attack was imminent. And this third um, kind of conclusion, that nothing can be done, justifies what Foreman called a fatalistic passivity, a response that he describes as strangely comforting rather than alarming. And so what we take from this is the idea that in fact resignation may in fact be a very rational response 
uh, to a situation that you feel that you cannot control. So the aim of this idea of a sociology of digital resignation is to evaluate how the contemporary digital economy is contributing to these feelings of public resignation. So what is it that companies are potentially doing to cultivate a sense of resignation among the public? And then what do we do with that? So um, this project is kind of bigger than two investigators and is bigger than, than these um, uh, you know, specific questions. But what we want to do today is focus on one type of corporate rhetoric um, that uh, Joe's going to talk about in a second that will illustrate how uh, what Benson and Kirsch call corporate acknowledgement and token accommodation actually becomes a vehicle for cultivating resignation among a public. Yeah, this stuff is not an accident is what we're trying to say. This is very much, we would argue, a purposeful activity to make these tokens of accommodation and use rhetoric for the purposes of, in the long term, it's not like people sit around saying, we want to encourage resignation. But I think there's an intuitive understanding that if you obfuscate enough, you're going to get in this, this uh, situation to occur. Now, I'm using the term obfuscation here different from Helen Isabel. Helen uh, has uh, used the idea of obfuscation as a strategy for members of the public to obfuscate what they're doing, mess up the way you shop so that uh, data companies can't figure it out, right? That purpose of obfuscation. We could discuss whether or not that's a good strategy. We're using the term obfuscation here to mean how companies make what they find so difficult to understand as to get people to basically throw up their hands. And here are some examples of that. So first of all, what is obfuscation? Um, the deliberate addition of ambiguous, confusing, or misleading information to interfere with surveillance and data collection. That's Helen and Finn Bruton's definition, but it sort of fits what we're talking about here, only on the other side of it. Arguing that four forms of market-based obfuscation, one through placation, another through diversion, another through jargon, and another through misnaming, and I'm going to talk very briefly about each one and how it takes place. And if you think about how all of this stuff works together, you can see how a person might very well throw up her hand. Here's obfuscation through placation. This is from ShopRite supermarkets. What they say on their outside, if, you're, if you go into the privacy policy, which almost nobody does, you would find the first thing they say is, we do not sell or rent your personal information to third parties in the ordinary course of our business, and that kind of thing. We don't disclose. But what they really do, if you read lower, it says, we or my web grocer, which is an affiliate, may link this information with other personal information about you, may use this linked information to allow third parties to serve ads on our website, or mobile applications or serve ads to you on a third party website. Basically, what they're saying is we allow companies to put tags on our website. They actually sell that stuff. So indirectly, they are selling your information. But that's not what they said beforehand. Obfuscation through diversion. Kroger, a very big supermarket chain, freaking out over Amazon nowadays. Uh, they are placating you by saying, uh, you know, we recognize that privacy is important. We price are protected. We, we don't uh, sell it to anybody, but essentially they say we'll protect and preserve your privacy, but they're diverting it because they may not sell it directly to anybody, but they're using your data incredibly to figure you out for their own purposes as you walk through the supermarket, changing prices on you, sending you coupons based upon your, your history, buying stuff about you, and other things. Obfuscation through jargon, I can't read all of this, but even words like third-party software, uh, third-party, uh, you know, all this stuff about webs, webs and beacons and similar technologies, cookies, most people would have no clue what this means. And through misnaming, I'll just notice, the big, biggest problem with misnaming is the word privacy policy. We find, and we have a number of surveys and an article coming out to show this, the great percentage of Americans from 2003 to the present gets wrong the idea that if a website has a privacy policy, it means the site will protect your information uh, and not share it unless you ask. Most people get that wrong. OK, 
Okay, so um, now that we have this sort of example of one way in which this idea of resignation potentially is being cultivated by companies, what we're interested in kind of moving forward with is a strategy for building this project of, of social resignation through understanding um, collective responses to this uh, idea. And in doing so, um, we're really hoping to try and, and understand more what the dynamics of resignation are. So do feelings of resignation, for example, encourage people to fight back against systems that they find unfair, or does it encourage a type of inaction, uh, that which maybe was observed by Foreman? How might education, or what we sometimes call digital media literacy, uh, influence people's le levels of resignation and their responses to those feelings? So one of the things we found um, in our study was that, in fact, people with higher sort of digital literacy on the measures that we were using indicated also higher levels of resignation. So in fact, the more you knew, the more likely you were to kind of uh, feel resigned. Um, and uh, also a question of is resignation, this kind of resignation that we're talking about, best understood at the sort of social level or at the individual level, or do we have to understand it um, in both ways? Um, and so I want to kind of uh, end here because we are trying to build this theory of resignation of pointing to another space where we, we find people talking about resignation. Um, and uh, although it's kind of easy, I think, to, to view resigned in action as an acceptance of the status quo, um, here is an alternative position, and that is that resigned inaction is in fact the only form of resistance in an environment characterized by entrenched asymmetries of power. And this view comes from the cultural critic Theodore Adorno, who invoked the, or he, who evoked the term resignation in response to his own critics, who argued that he and the other members of the Frankfurt School were interested in developing critical sociology, but not in actually uh, promoting the types of activities that would engage in the transference of, uh, of theory into praxis. So uh, as you likely know, Adorno joined with other members of the Frankfurt School to describe how powerful industrial and cultural forces um, left little room uh, for individual expression or dissent. And in uh, the face of this powerlessness, he argued that uh, it was a futile act for the individual to do anything. Because in fact, action within this system, he argued, ensconced power within the system rather than dispelling it. So unlike a foreman who reviewed uh, resigned in action as a rational response to conditions that one cannot change, Adorno actually said that failure to take on a system that is designed to thwart efforts of the individual is not only a rational response, but in fact a critical response. So um, we don't necessarily kind of agree with the sort of fatalistic passivity that, that Adorno is promoting here. Um, but what we've argued is that the, this idea of the sociology of resignation um, kind of needs to uh, uh, take on theories from a range of perspectives, and in that we include, we include critical cultural studies, political economy, social psychology, and behavioral economics. And we hope to approach this um, uh, through a range of scholarly questions, which may include questions about the historical, institutional, interpersonal pressures that make the continuance of these rhetorics of, for example, obfuscation possible, the extent to which the cultivation of resignation is a deliberate strategy of contemporary capitalist systems, and what the historical antecedents for this practice are, and the extent to which digital resignation may relate to problems beyond information privacy, including online harassment and digital misinformation campaigns. We're also interested in the ways in which digital resignation may manifest differently in different populations. Um, so we actually just heard that um, uh, some researchers in France uh, replicated our study and found lower levels of resignation, but still significant levels of resignation in that population as well. So um, these are the types of questions that we're interested in, and we really look forward to your comments as we kind of continue to think about this. Thank you. Well, um, welcome everybody. My name is Nicholas, as you already know. I'm a PhD student in Munich at the Techn Technical University of Munich, a part of the Munich Center for Technology and Society. And originally it was planned to do the presentation together with um, my supervisor, Jan Edmund Passer, which sadly cannot be with us today. However, um, I will give you a short introduction in a project we are currently uh, engaged in um, about public broadcasting and then draw a little theoretical insights into um, 
how they try to build up structures in order to produce data and how this is related to our uh, sociological understandings of problems. So, first of all, I give you a little bit of insight into the project. Uh, what you're actually seeing here is um, um, the signing of a contract of different different uh, broadcasters throughout Germany where they um, decide on what they should what should be aired and what not, what type of content, um, what are the rules of the broadcasting within Germany. And this is a very special re uh, special reason because in Germany there is something called like um, and there is a sort of determined word, but there's no good uh, no good translation for that. <coughs> it's called the Dung of Tag, which basically means um, that uh, public broadcasters have a legal obligation to present you a wide variety of different uh, opinions, perspectives, worldviews, and have to present you what's going on in social and political life. This was basically coming out uh, after uh, World War II. Because the whole experience during the World War II that uh, the media system, a really centralized media system, was used for propaganda, was not so that great experience uh, of the world. So they decided that they have to have, first of all, um, this, uh, legal pressure to say, okay, you're basically not allowed to do that anymore. And the second thing is that they're really uh, decentralized in the media system. So in Germany, you now have a lot of different broadcasters that are infrastructurally um, and legally disconnected from each other, so even if they want to, they cannot cooperate at the moment. And by the way, they don't want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's basically uh, basically um, the background of this whole uh, legal obligation. And the question now, um, what are we doing? What we are doing is, we've been uh, in a project with a Bavarian broadcaster, a Bavarian public broadcaster, it's PR. Um, because they're trying to give themselves now a new media platform or a video and demand platform, that's it. And the real issue with that, that in itself is not a real problem, but the real issue with that is that within the system they also have recommendation uh, systems and recommendation algorithms. And the problem with that is that the recommendation algorithms are basically made to create filter models, basically to select information for you that is based on your own worldview, that is based on your consumption behaviors and therefore basically made to cut out a lot of information of what's going on in, uh, in the world outside there. So we know all these um, this issues, there's this wonderful book of Edith Aida, from the model, I think from 2012, if not wrong. Um, and other, uh, other persons who have been talking about this thing. So that is basically the background of the whole project. Um, and what's happening now here is um, that we have now we have now different ideas of what is relevant content, right? What I just described is that recommendation uh, systems have to have a certain idea of what content they should provide to you. The interesting part is um, that before we had the uh, recommendation algorithms, we already had a little, a little bit of tension how to present uh, data. For example, we had these legal obligations that I just told you that they have to present a lot of information about social life that's going on, but we also had editorial curation ideas like what is hot content, what is good content, what is interesting, what keeps users engaged, like this more the logic of popularity on, or keeping users engaged with their, uh, with their own program. And this is already a little bit of tension because you have to balance these two. Um, what's coming now is that with the algorithmic system, there is another tension coming in with the editorial curation, which is a huge discussion right now, and say, okay, the algorithm is taking away power from us to decide what we want to air. And on the other hand, uh, there is this issue with the legal obligations that I just told you. So the problem is now, do we create filter bubbles or not? How is this uh, in legal terms um, doable? And the very interesting part is that within this media system, we have now three different logics of how to select content, or the question is how do we assign relevance to content? So this is why we came in, because somehow you have to balance all these different ideas towards each other, uh, which is not easy. Um, yeah, and so social scientists came and said, yeah, okay, maybe we can figure out something together with social, um, uh, social engineers, sorry, uh, with uh, engineers, with computer scientists, with data scientists, which is really interesting because we're regularly meeting, having discussions, um, also learning a lot. I learned a lot about data science uh, during the last year, which was pretty hard, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the question is then, okay, how can we connect this now a little bit also to conference theme that is power and data, right? So I'm talking a lot about uh, relevance, about error, but not about power. And 
when I was preparing the slides and preparing to talk about myself, yeah, we have a lot of different ideas for power. We have um, a lot of takes on it, so maybe just go through some of them and see what actually are you thinking of it. Yeah? Well, everybody knows that guy, I think. Um, that's Max Weber. And his idea of power is basically to act according to uh, your own will, even against resistance. So that you really can force yourself into something. That, uh, that was the basic uh, definition of power. The other second uh, great sociologist by the time, Emil Durkheim, had a completely different idea of power, which was more about the social facts. That social structure is creating social facts that uh, exert power upon the individuals. So here is not the individual that exerts power, it's all a structural effect. Um, that bearded man is called Marx. <laughs> um, had this idea of power is based on the means of production. Uh, <coughs> a real, materialistic idea of power. If you have something, you can do something. Really short. Then we have Tucker Parsons, and we're coming closer to what I want to get as a power. Because Tucker Parsons says, yeah, the power, power is the ability to order and structure social systems and accordingly to solve an issue. And this is already getting really close to what um, what we have with algorithmic systems because they are solving issues, right? Um, but the problem is, what is the issue? Where does this issue come from? And here we have uh, my open favorite, uh, Michel. <coughs> who says, yeah, issues of uh, knowledge are always created in a, uh, in a rationality of go uh, governance. And, uh, the late Foucault then turned this uh, framework of mentality, which is very prominent nowadays. And the point is, now we have, we have to have built structures in order to solve issues that respond to a certain, uh, certain rationality within broader, a broader frame of governance. So what we have is no longer that we have relevance to, but we have different problems that we need to solve. And as we will see, we need to solve them in very different ways. But the question is now, okay, now we have this very sociological viewpoint of what is power, uh, how should we structure all the software and stuff, and data, uh, we have a lot about, a lot of work yesterday. Um, then computer scientists come and say, yeah, that we're just doing data, we're just doing the algorithms, the math, and Data tells us what it is, uh, right? It's more or less this narrative here. But I say, yeah, what, what are we doing? We're just collecting data, data that's already out there, then we recombine it into a huge database because, of course, we can easily do that. Right? Then we, um, then out of that, our mathematical models, uh, the structures, uh, emerge magically because we apply some, uh, some data science and stuff. And then we get something that we can interpret or create knowledge out of this. So that is basic uh, basic and very positive data science narrative or big data narrative um, that's out there. And that's not really uh, compatible to what I just told you about, about the power before. Because I would argue that it's exactly the other way around. We start with the issue, like what do we want to learn? What do we need to solve? And then we apply the algorithms, and according to the algorithms, we collect all the different data for that. Uh, that we produce the data, which is quite important. If we have now that idea that we produce data and that we have issues accordingly to that we produce data, then the question is, of course, what is the issue for an algorithm? What is the issue for a recommendation system? <laughs> and that is now, now gets a little bit mathematical. Um, it took me a long time to understand that, actually. Um, what it is, it's about comparability. It's not about meaning. It's not about, um, it's not about I want to know what the world is about. It's really about comparability. What, and I'll show you a slide later how it's, how it's calculated, actually. But what is, how it is done here, you have a vector room that is calculated based on the data you captured. And you see, ah, OK, I have an item. Can I just walk here? I have an item that is an apple, that is a banana. And you go, apple and banana might be really similar because they're fruits. But it both is nothing like a fruit. So it's the vector is not that close to that. So what you have, and by the way, you don't know what the state factors are. That's absolutely unknown to you. The algorithm, the algorithm gives you something that then you say, that's similar. That sounds good. I can repeat it as if you had an apple, you might want a banana, but you don't want a gold. Yeah. That's basic logic that is applied here. Um, and that comes with a lot of assumptions, right? And the assumptions get hopefully a little bit clearer when we look at the calculations. 
Okay, I don't know if it gets clearer, but <laughs> in a minute, maybe. <laughs> um, because these vectors are basically calculated based on these matrices. What they're doing is the collecting data, and this is the latent factor models that's used for users who like that, also like that, like the, uh, the Amazon models. People who bought that book also bought that book. And the question here is now, what is this matrix telling us? It tells us users rated items uh, with specific values, the higher the better. And what you're trying to do now is factorize these matrix accordingly to see if you can find patterns in there. There, there what you're creating here is a, a vector room that you don't know what it actually means, but that helps you to describe each and every item and each and every user according to the same system of reference. And that is important because then it becomes comparable. Then you can say, okay, this vector is similar to that vector, that might be the same thing. Although I don't know why they're the same thing, but they might be similar to each other. The point is, in collecting all the data, you have a lot, a lot of uh, assumptions already in there, so that you rate similar items with similar, uh, similar things, for example. So if you like an apple, you would also uh, rate banana higher, because obviously you like fruit, right? On the other hand, it also assumes that people who like similar things are similar to each other. So you're being reduced to a very, very specific set um, of attributes that are used into this formula uh, to create something like comparability. And you can, an interesting thing is, the exact same method is also used in text mining and other recommendations that they just replace user with documents and item with words. And then you have the exact same thing. You can say, ah, this text is similar to that text, but I don't know why, but they are similar, right? Because they have a similar structure in words, which I don't really know what it is, but a lot of strong assumptions that words that come together within text are similar to each other. And having, I like bananas and I, I like not, I don't like bananas, might be similar, although to me exactly the uh, different thing. So, and that, that come, uh, what I want to say here is algorithms come with assumptions about the environment, about the data they're collecting. So they need specific data to do something. Um, I don't know if you have been in town yesterday, but we heard a little bit of uh, about predictive policing. They work in a similar way to say, if someone broke into that house, uh, the probability that someone breaks into the house next to it is way up. So this is already an assumption that you need specific data uh, to interpret the model to make it tangible to the algorithm, right? The problem now is, and that is a huge problem also for this public broadcast, and now we're coming back to case study, um, is that the data is not that um, positivistic that just given. Uh, most probably you know that picture or variations from that because we are on the data conference, and data is contingent. Data is not just given, data is something that is made up. Um, uh, data is, okay. <coughs> I mean, in semiotics, you would say that um, data is the process of giving meaning to science or connecting connecting concepts to science, and in the process of meaning making, you would create this science. So I will give you a short experiment, and I'll try this before, so it seems kind of how it goes. Um, but the point is, data is not in itself comparable, because we can attribute different meanings to the same things, which is a problem for the algorithm, because the algorithm uh, assumes that same meanings apply to the same things in order to make them comparable in that vector loop, right? <coughs> and that is the thing that I never tried before and I'm really curious if it works out. Look at it for like three seconds. Think of one word you would connect with to that. Okay? Can someone give me one word? Mirror. Pardon? Mirror. Mirror. Okay, another word? Mountain. Mountain, in other words, like. Okay? Now we like wonderful. Now we have mirror and reflection is somewhat similar. Uh, we have a mountain that also describes the picture very well. When I looked at it, I came up with lake, um, which is also different, but it's the same picture. So here we see that we in three seconds just we assign different meanings to the same picture, which makes it impossible for any algorithm to uh, to use it. So that is the that is the huge issue that um, the public broadcast is also um, grappling with because they have 300 editorial teams. They have um, 
that all feed all the data in a central database, and then they want the algorithm to use that data. But they all have exactly the same problem. So what they're trying to do is um, bring all these different understandings of the world together uh, and make it comparable, which is, at the moment, a really tough task. Um, gladly, in STS and social science, we have one concept that allows us a little bit to think about that or to see uh, how could we, how could we um, grow up with that. And that's a mechanical activity. Uh, it's a concept introduced by uh, Gallus and Sesson, or uh, Porta also. And it says that objectivity or comparability is created in displaying these bodies of science. So it really came out of science studies. And the, the point here is, in order to create uh, the same, same experience with the material world, you have to discipline the scientist's body. Um, it is a depersonalization of the data production, because the idea is if you train people to do it all in the same way, it doesn't matter if I do it, it doesn't matter if you're doing it, it doesn't matter if someone else is doing it, because we are all trained the same way. Um, basically, that means disciplining the body is really, really important for that. And as I already said, the whole concept comes out uh, of science studies, so it is really a in science studies. Um, oh, okay, just speed up a little bit. Um, the point is, it's really interesting. I once tried it, tried it uh, myself in the lab, trying to all that stuff, and just said, no, you're doing it all wrong. Yeah, go back to school and then come back in a year or so. so that is exactly the pro uh, problem that we're facing right now, that they have a multiplicity of different mechanical activities that they're trying to integrate into one database, right? But um, from the data production viewpoint, they're really combining different contexts of data production. And, and I'm scripting on this for a little bit hard because uh, we're at short in time. And sometimes there really are also um, predictably rest of undisciplined data because people don't really have an idea how they should even apply data to that. That's a really huge issue because they have time, they have um, uh, responsibility issues and stuff like that. They can really decide how to apply data. And what they're trying to do now is to integrate the central system to do that. So the whole point of that, uh, the whole thing is that data production is not just uh, the big data narrative that you not just not. It is really an interconnected system, a network of different actors influencing each other, trying to create um, what is called a dispositive data production. So what data production basically is, is already is a version of a power system that is in place or has to be brought into place in order to make it recognizable for algorithmic, um, algorithmic calculations and comparability. And now I told you a lot about this uh, public broadcasters, but a wonderful book that I can really recommend and just came out in May from Roger Maris about the true sociology, where she talks a lot about all the so uh, social uh, infrastructures that we're using in the internet right now that are really configuring how we produce data, which she frames more in a way of we have to be really, uh, be really aware of that if we use social media data, because the question is what are we measuring really? But it's also true for all other data productions that are, that are being used. By the way, that's a picture of the India. So, pretty cool. One minute. Okay, wonderful. Uh, then I will skip the last few slides and just show you one thing um, that shows that really, really nicely. Um, actually, I tried it. It's not that popular, but you cannot, re you really cannot in a relationship with yourself because the name is just deleted. You're in a relationship, but with someone that you don't know. Yeah. Uh, but still, it shows you that all these um, dispositives of data production have an impact on how we produce data. Yeah. So that doesn't show up anymore? That doesn't show up anymore. No. It's an old picture. And it's, to be fair, I'm not sure if you ever did, because it's from college humor. Um, but, uh, but I tried it, and you cannot be in a relationship with yourself, which is a pity. But, yeah. um, well, let's give all the other uh, slides. Okay. Thank you.